thank you for all coming here. My name is Robert Laramie. I'm an associate professor at Swansea University. And I've been studying data visualization since around 1999. This talk has two titles. The first title is Data Mining with D Data Visualization. And the second title is From Data Chaos to the Visualization Cosmos. A friend of mine gave a talk a few years back in 2011, Professor Meister Edward Rula, and he, he gave a talk without any title. So I thought, if he can give a talk with zero titles, I will give a talk with two titles. So let's jump right in. This is both an overview and the main focus of the talk. It's called the ubiquitous pattern of knowledge evolution. It sounds very abstract, but it's not very abstract. It's something I think we're all very familiar with in some senses. In some, we're all familiar with this evolution at some of its stages, if not all of its stages. So this is something that, this is a pattern that, that we can observe over and over again in the entire industrialized world, everywhere. When we use digital technology, we can observe this pattern. It doesn't matter which background we're, we're from, who we study, which company we run, where we live necessarily, as long as it has electricity and so on. So the, the pattern looks like this. So it starts with a real-world challenge. Maybe we have a problem we want to solve. Maybe we want to have an understanding we would like to gain. Or maybe we'd like to make some sort of a change or an improvement. Maybe we want to build something. So we start with a real-world challenge, and then we look traditionally to a real world solution or what we call here an analog or physical approach to solve a problem. For example, building a car, right, or building an airplane or, or something like this. And that's the traditional approach to build something physical to solve or to reach a goal or to increase understanding. But we sometimes find the whole world as challenges, right? Maybe it's not feasible. Maybe that thing, that problem we're trying to solve, like understanding a person's behavior, is not feasible in a physical sense. Or observing marine wildlife deep under, in deep depth, deep ocean water is not possible. Or maybe it's too expensive. That's also something that happens. A physical or analog solution is too expensive. So we run into, we, we run into a problem and we make, make a shift from the analog to the digital world or the, the software world. Right? So we think, oh, a physical approach might not be feasible. Maybe it's too expensive. But everybody knows about the rapid advances in hardware technology, the rapid advances in cheap computing, and virtually free storage. So they look for a digital solution to their problems. Right? That's what this, this dotted line. So they look for a digital solution to the problems that might not be feasible in the real world. However, these digital solutions create a new kind of problem. Digital solutions usually generate massive amounts of data. So we have a new problem. And this is, this is the, the, the evolution of knowledge that we're all very familiar with, these first five stages. And I think everybody in the audience here today is very interested in the last, the last two stages, trying to make sense of the massive amounts of data that we're generating for, for all of our digital solutions. Right? This is what I call data chaos, and this is everywhere. Right? And probably a lot of people in this audience have lots of data sets that they're trying to make sense of. 
and what was slowly starting to see collectively on the on the in the pattern of knowledge evolution is visualization, this awareness that a field of science, a computer science exists called data visualization, which promises to make sense of this data chaos. This is the next stage of knowledge evolution, and we're currently seeing a massive wave of of visualization development, right? So that's the basic pattern of knowledge evolution. And the rest of the talk is giving concrete examples of these six stages from a real world challenge to the visualization cosmos. However, the focus is on the last two stages, the data chaos to visualization cosmos. If there are any questions or comments, feel free to interrupt at any time. Yeah. Don't have to wait until the end. So we can see the data chaos everywhere. We can see this pattern everywhere. It doesn't matter where we look. We can see it in computational fluid dynamics. We can see physicists and astronomers facing these dilemmas. Right? It's not, it's not possible. That's a very good example of the it's not possible to, to study all the stars and black holes physically, right? We see this problem with marine biologists and biochemists, psychologists, sociologists, sports scientists, journalists, and those studying the humanities. We see this, this, this evolution with governments and councils. We can see this in the banks call centers, and we can see this in retail, websites, transportation, the list is, ev is endless, right? It's everywhere. And you can see this, you can experience this yourself, right, as you collect your own photos, maybe you have a collection of like 10,000 selfies, or something like that, it turns into chaos, right? Everyone and everywhere, people like to collect, this is another Contributing factor to the data chaos. People just like to collect things. They might not even have a goal that they're trying to solve, a goal they're trying to reach, or a problem they're trying to solve. They just like to collect. Now, there are two font colors here. There's a green font and, and black font. The green font shows some of the areas that we've worked on and try to develop data visualization solutions for. And we're going to talk about some of those examples right now. We're going to go through this, this pattern of knowledge evolution. Does anyone here, has anybody here studied data visualization yet? Or been exposed to that? Okay, so we're going to give a two slide introduction to data visualization. So data visualization is using computer graphics to generate images of complex data sets. So it's not the same as computer graphics. Computer graphics is generating fictitious images, right? From video games and, and films. This is usually what we think about when we think of computer graphics. Visualization tries to generate images that are reality, that reflect real things happening try to reflect reality. So visualization exploits our powerful visual system. We have several billion neurons dedicated to our, you know, to our visual processing and our visual cortex, or 30 pecs, right, which is at the back. And that, that numbers, that, those numbers or that size is not very meaningful until we put it into context so we only have 8% of the cortex dedicated for touch and 3% for hearing. So we have you know, anywhere from 4 to 10 times more <coughs> cortex dedicated to visual processing than the other senses. So it's, it makes sense to explore, no pun intended, it makes sense to explore the, the visual processing power in our brains as opposed to others for the other senses right and it's dedicated to processing color motion texture shapes and so on. now data visualization 
is is has some some strengths and some goals itself. So one of the goals of data visualization is to explore data. So this might be the case when you don't know anything about your data set and you just want to find out what it looks like, its characteristics, if there are any outliers or trends or patterns in the data. It's for the person that's not very familiar with the data set. It's good for analysis to confirm or refute a hypothesis. Maybe you're an expert and you collected the data with a special purpose in mind and you want to confirm or refute a hypothesis or answer a question. And visualization is also good for presentation, which is what we're going to do today, a lot of present presentation. So once our exploration and our analysis are finished, we can present the results to a wider audience. Visualization is also good for acceleration to speed something, a process, uh, usually a, a decision-making process or a knowledge discovery process, and maybe we can see things that were otherwise impossible or are otherwise impossible to see. So let, let's look at this first example of, of this pattern of knowledge evolution. And this is from business. Anybody here work in business? Two people. One of our company partners called QPC is an innovator in call center technology. And their goal is to understand call center behavior more. Right? To increase their understanding of call center behavior, all the activities that occur inside the call center. Right? The call center is full of agents. And the agents are answering thousands, hundreds of thousands of calls every day. And it, how, how can we increase our understanding of, of all those events and what's happening inside of a call center? Well, if we go down the analog or the physical route, we could hire more people that stand around and watch you know, what's happening in the call center and try to take notes and figure out, okay, I think I see something over there. Or maybe use CCTV or something to try to film everything that's going on. But you can see if we go down the physical route to, to understanding call center behavior, it's going to be very expensive and not very practical. Right? So the analog solution to hire more people just to watch is not really feasible and it costs, would cost too much money. So they chose a digital solution, as, as we all do, right? They decide to design an event database. So the database logs all the events that occur in a call center. Who called, when they called, how much time they spent <coughs> navigating the menus inside the interactive voice recognition system, how long they spent in the queue, queuing for to talk to an agent, whether or not they abandoned their call, and who, which agent they spoke to, and, or multiple agents they spoke to, and how long they spoke to those agents, and so on. And that digital solution, that, that event database, stores millions of events, so every day, actually, because call centers generate lots of activities. The UK employs over a million people in call centers, so more than 5% of its workforce just work in call centers. It's a, a large market. So how do we, well, how do we take the, the chaos of, of call center data and visualize it to make sense out of it? So that's, that's what we're going we're to look at right at this minute. Instead of using slides, we're going to look at a video demo because I'm not such a big fan of slides. So we use something called a tree map as one of the ways to visualize the call center data. Right, so this is what a tree map looks like. And the tree map is a hierarchical data structure that lets us start with an overview of the data and then zoom in down to different levels of detail. So 
we can, in this case, the size of the, this, the rectangles is mapped to call volume, right? So these are the different hours starting from midnight to midnight again, right? So we see, okay, this is when the call center opens, right? And the call volume increases, right? If the call volume reaches its maximum at around lunchtime, and then it starts to descend again. And the, the color is mapped to a, the percentage of abandoned calls. So we can notice, for example, the call center is trying to avoid abandoned calls. So we can notice a big increase in abandoned calls in the evening, right around after dinner, like 7 p.m., 8 p.m. And the, the, the user can map the calls to, to, to different colors or different color schemes, right? That's what the, we're doing over here. And they can also map the colors to different kinds of events. For example, that's the last event. For example, abandoning calls or, or success calls. We can also navigate the tree map so we can zoom in smoothly and then see more details. So now we zoom in on a single hour and each rectangle represents a single call. Right? So we can visualize single calls and how long they last. So look, here's a call that lasted two hours. Like these strange calls that last a long time jump right out. Right? So probably they spent a long time an agent, a very dedicated agent, spent a long time trying to solve a customer's problem. The user can use this clock to smoothly zoom and navigate to each hour, right? So we have a smooth zooming and panning operation. And the clock is there so we don't get lost, so we can easily see which hour we, we're on, even when we zoom in, right? And this is getting late into the, into the evening. So we can zoom in even further. One hour, by the way, is broken up into 10 minute intervals. And then those 10 minute <clears throat> intervals are broken up into single minute intervals. And we also have a histogram, uh, a, a standard histogram on the left, which also serves to, to navigate through the data and provides an overview. So it's sorted by 10 minute intervals, each bar represents a 10 minute interval, but we can switch it to hour intervals if we want to. And then color is mapped to some data attribute chosen by the user. In this case, it's the average call length, right, which we can see up here. So we can see suddenly during the evening, the average call length increases, and we can see over the course of a day, for some reason, overall, the average call length increases throughout the day as it is an overall trend. Now, there must be one rectangle in the three map, but it's one person. Correct, it's one call, it's one phone call. In the bottom level, in the bottom level, see how there are two levels? So let's go back a second. So here, this is the, this is the low level, this is the fine level of detail. Each rectangle represents a single phone call. And in this case, how long the call lasted. Right, so here's a phone call that lasted longer than its neighbor or the successor. But at the, at the top level, at this level, these are not individual calls. So this is an hour. And then each hour is broken up into 10 minute blocks. So we have six 10 minute blocks. And then each 10 minute block is broken up into individual minutes. So minutes worth of calls, incoming calls. What are the calls of the call center? Correct, correct, yep. Any other questions before I hit play again? So this was, this was exciting. This is an exciting project. Because this is the first time that the, the company and ourselves have ever seen an overview of the call center activity, ever, in any, in any way, shape, or form. So as soon as we saw an overview, we could immediately make observations about the call center volume, the, the, 
the increasing level of abandoned calls, so we can see from the red color the increasing number of abandoned calls, the average call length increasing as we go through, throughout the day, and we can finally see what's happening. Now we can filter the calls using these different kinds of filters. This is the analytical part of the process. So now we're seeing something called a focus and context visualization where the, we're looking at the, we're focusing on the calls that spend a longer time in the queue process. So they usually just change the total time and queue filter and now we've got those. And now we're going to focus on the inbound calls. So call centers have inbound calls and outbound calls, right? Calls made by agents to other agents or, or consult calls. So these are filtered by completed calls, right? And now we can we can combine filters. So these are out completed calls, but also calls that spend longer times queuing. So we can combine the filters in different ways. Right, now we can click on an individual call and then find out more, the most detailed level of information, like how much time they spent in the IVR navigating the menus, how much time they spent queuing, and how much time they spent talking to an agent. So here we have two different queuing events, an agent event, a second agent event, back in the queue, back to another agent, and back to, into the queue again. So that was a complicated phone call. Right? Probably we've all been, all been there, because we all have to call call centers sometimes. Right? So that's, we, that's the lowest level of, and we get the type of call, in this case it's a consult call. Right? It has, and it shows the number of events, one IVR event, four queuing events, and four different agent events. This just shows the, the proportion, the each event as a unit proportion because sometimes the, the events disappear when they're too short in the, in the traditional version. Any questions about the call center example? Is it the web tool? Which language was it developed? All the, all the tools we're going to show today were developed with three key technologies. One is OpenGL, the computer graphics, the standard computer graphics. One is called Qt or Qt, which is the GUI library, and the and C++. So they, we always use those tools. With those tools, we can we can get most of our. Uh, but did you deploy this software to a customer or? Uh... This was built for a company called QPC. So QPC is a develops innovative call center solutions, and they have customers, the ones that we're all familiar with, like Vodafone and Virgin and BT and, and those sorts of things. What was the outcome of the, the study, like whether some kind of change is made in the process, or can you speak about uh, that as well? That's a very good question. So it's, well, firstly, it's ongoing, so we're still developing, we're still working together, we're still developing visualization solutions. But the, the company has responded very positively, so they, I, I know they've used the software to get, to get a new client. For example, I can't remember the name of the client, and they are using the software for marketing purposes to, 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 to sell more, more of their solutions to, to new clients. So they, they mentioned a shift in their marketing strategy using the visualization software. They want to develop more analytical solutions, software solutions that they can present to their customers to use. Another question? Uh, <clears throat> you uh, display uh, very long calls uh, by uh, red color. And uh, my question is uh, you display only one call in 10 minutes, but the call is two hours longer. That's correct. 
Yeah, good observation, yes. So that really what we're visualizing is the when the call started. So as he just pointed out, some calls, they might last two hours. So if we were to, to visualize somehow the length of the call spanning the two hours here, it would stretch across multiple hour spaces. And that's, that's correct. So somehow it's, it's a hybrid of the start time and then trying to encapsulate the, the duration with the size of the rectangle. But if you have some ideas about how to have those rectangles span the whole space, we're happy to hear your ideas. It, it, it seems like it would make it very messy and complicated if we tried to stretch the rectangles over multiple hours, but that may be something we look into. Any other questions? This is just the first example. We still have 15 more examples to go. <laughs> We're not going to have time for that many. Here's another exciting example from CFD. Has anybody heard of computational fluid dynamics in the audience? Do you, do you work in computational fluid? So you're going to like this one. So computational fluid dynamics is the engineering discipline of trying to predict fluid flow, the behavior of fluid flow, fluid motion, as it interacts with geometries like cars or ships or airplanes, right? And in, in, if we want to understand how a fluid is going to interact with a surface, one way to do that is to build an actual surface and to, to generate a flow environment and try to visualize the flow with smoke or dye or other substance, substances. And this is something people do a lot. This is a field of engineering. But it is very expensive. Right? To fly an airplane to just do a test flight and then try to visualize the flow around the wings with smoke is a very expensive experiment, right? Very expensive. So there are analog solutions, but somebody said, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could come up with a digital solution that makes this, this, this investigation more feasible, right? To accelerate the investigation and, and make it less expensive, right? And that's the inspiration behind computational fluid dynamics, right? And here are two examples. Here's, here's an example of uh, a combustion chamber inside an automobile engine. And the idea is we want to get a perfect mixture of fuel to, to, to air. And the way the engineers propose to do that is to create this helical motion inside the combustion chamber, right? And for the, the diesel engine example, the ideal motion or the ideal mixture of fluid flow motion is a tumble motion about an imaginary axis inside this geo. Right, so the, that's the idea. We can, we, build, we can build the real solutions, but it's nice to go through a digital process first before we build the real solutions so we don't have to build as many real solution, so to speak, right? So the analog solution is to build, as obviously happen, but we can, it goes through a digital process first. The digital solution is computational fluid dynamics, but as we know, in computational fluid dynamics, their big, big challenge, their number one challenge, is the, num the, the amount of data that they, that they generate, which is gigabytes and terabytes, right? Those CFD simulations run for weeks, even months, even on high performance computing machines. So the question is, how can we use visualization to make sense of this massive amount of CFD data? So let's look at some data visualization solutions for CFD data. So we're visualizing the swirl and the tumble motion, right? This is the, the tumble motion example. So those are called path, pathlets, or they're short path lines, 
right, in the flow along the direction, the tangent direction of the flow, right, and the color is mapped to so-called crank angle, right, so we have a, this cylinder that moves up and down in a thousand, a thousand times or a thousand cycles per minute, right. This is using vortex core lines, a combination of these green paths are vortex core lines, so the centers of swirling flow, right, combined with the particles, right, and the particles show the flow behavior around the vortex course. So this is a feature-based, what we call a feature-based flow visualization. It's looking for special features in the flow, right? This is visualizing the flow at the surface itself, right? And these are so-called critical points. So that's a sink, and that's a saddle point, and that's another one. And then there are some lines that connect the different, the different sinks and sources. Those are called, those are special kinds of streamlines called separatrices, and it's showing the topology of the flow. The topology is the skeletal representation of the flow. <coughs> So here we're seeing the time-dependent topology of the flow, the sinks, the sources, the saddle points, and the vortex core lines. The vortex core lines are these, these, these tubes in the middle. We also see the separatrices on the boundaries of the surface. And they're all being shown, animated over time. That's a, slow, that's a slow motion version of time, by the way. It's slowed down quite a lot. So in, in reality, this, this, this is the piston head inside of a, an engine, and it's, it's cranking up and down you know, at, at hundreds of times per, per minute. Right? That's a volume visualization of the fluid flow, specifically the vortices. So the vortices are the areas of swirling motion, right? And the red is mapped to one color, one direction of swirl flow and the other. So these are two different kinds of visualizations of the same data side by side. This is a texture-based visualization of the flow at the surface. And this is a volume visualization of the flow which shows the inside. And again, we're seeing the swirling motion, the swirling behavior of the flow with the volume visualization there. By the way, all of these videos are available on my webpage if you want to go have a look at them. They're also available on YouTube as well. So that was the CFD FlowViz example. Any? How, how, how does it improve? Uh... What is the usefulness of this, uh, this kind of visualization? Because in the case of uh, the call center, it was quite clear because you had another view of uh, the behavior of the call center. Yes, yes, I went too fast. That's, that's why it wasn't very clear. So the idea is to visualize the swirl and the tumble motion. That's, that's the goal. So in, in this case, the tumble motion is an imaginary axis that points out at the at the, the viewer, and then just like your tumble dryer, the the clothes circulate around the axis. Here we can see that there is an axis not pointing out; it's pointing <coughs> downwards and in, to the left. If there is an axis at all, it's a very unstable axis of rotation, and that's what these visualizations show. They show unstable yeah. rotational axes. So, in other words, the CFDs see this and they say, oh, wow, this is not tumble motion at all. There's a little bit of tumble motion, right, around the perimeter of the geometry. But as soon as we get in the middle, there is a there is swirling motion, but it's very far from the ideal kind of tumble motion that they're looking for. So they have to make some modifications to the geometry to try to make to get, to get the best mixing possible. And here, this is also not, this is very non-ideal swirl motion. So the swirl motion is off-center, 
right? He has an axis at, around which the, 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 the motion swirls, but it's off center. And there's another one. And there's another one going in the other direction. So again, they have not achieved their target of getting the, the ideal motion. Right? That's the idea. And that's what these visualizations show. They show the difference between the actual or predicted motion and the ideal for which they're striving. Right? And they show it in a, in a, using something called feature-based flow visualization, which looks for special features in the flow and then focuses the visualization on those features. Does that answer the question? Yeah, but the, the information of the fact that there is uh, an unstable flow, for example, yes. is already known a priori in the sense that uh, there is a software that computes the unstable uh, vortex, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. this is visualized with, with the, this uh, software. Yes, yes. One of the, the things that the engineers like to know is where where precisely is the flow misbehaving? So they know what they, that what they want to see and what they expect to see, but they like to see visualizations and say, oh, here's a problem. Here is exactly where the flow is, is not behaving the way we want it to. Mm -hmm. They like to see visualizations mm -hmm. that point that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, that's what everybody wants to see. In fact, that should be in the knowledge evolution pipeline. Everybody wants to see the, the parts of the behavior that aren't acting appropriately. So in the call center visualization, one of the things that the QPC wants to see is where are the abandoned calls? When are people not behaving properly? Here, the engineers want to see when is the flow not behaving properly? So this is one of the highlights of strengths of visualization to show when things go wrong. That's one of the good things about visualization. It's good at showing when things go wrong. How's my time? So you we know, have still a few minutes. So the next example is from marine biology. So I tried to pick a diverse set of examples and not all from just one one sort of domain. This is a collaboration with marine biologists. Are there any? I would be surprised if there are any marine biologists in the room. Anybody that's worked with marine biologists on data mining things? This is a fun world, by the way. I, I like the marine biologist world. <laughs> so th there are people, these marine biologists, that want to understand marine wildlife and how they behave, how marine wildlife behaves. And one of the challenges that they face is the, the deep underwater diving. Right? How do you study uh, an animal that likes to dive deep underwater, and maybe for, for hours at a time, or even days at a time? Right? How is that possible? So theoretically, the analog solution might be to follow the animal, right? That might be kind of an approach, follow the animal. But there are some problems with that, right? People cannot just dive a, a few kilometers underneath the water. That, that's not so easy, right? They can try to build submarines or something, but to try to to follow a cormant or a turtle in a submarine is not a very practical solution, and it's not very feasible. It's very expensive. And, and this is the, the fun part of that analog solution is that observation, this is one of those cases where the observation influences the behavior or could influence the behavior itself. So that's not good either. So they look to the digital world for a solution. As one, as we all do now, right? So they, they come up with these sensor devices in Swansea University. They're called the Daily Diary, and these sensor devices. They, this is an old one. They're smaller and more sophisticated now. This is already six or seven years old. They actually capture the animals like a cormorant. 
they attach the digital sensor or maybe more than one digital sensor to the cormorant or any other marine wildlife and then release it. Then they recapture the sensor a few hours or a few days later. They take it off the animal and they study the information that it collects about the local environment, right? It collects information on acceleration, local acceleration. It collects information about the local temperature, pressure, ultraviolet light, and a few other properties. Another challenge currently, by the way, is that GPS does not work underneath, underwater at great depths. So there's, it's not possible to just plot the path naively in a dead reckoning fashion the same way we can with land animals. However, when they get this data, this is what it looks like. Well, this is a tiny little piece of what it looks like. They plot for every, for every attribute magnitude versus time. So magnitude is on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis. Right? And they claim, I don't believe them actually, <laughs> they claim they can infer animal behavior based on these wave patterns. Like they can look at a wave pattern and say, oh, that looks like the animal diving or this looks like the animal hunting. I actually don't believe them. I don't believe they can do that. They do claim they can do that. But you can see that that's not easy, right? And this is only a few seconds of data. If you plot a day's worth of data, it will wrap around this building a few times. And the acceleration has three components, x, y, and z. These, these, are, these three components are decoupled. In reality, it's a vector, right, in three space. So they asked us if we could come up with some visualizations that facilitate the understanding of the marine wildlife behavior. So we, we tried to do that. And that's our next demo. So this is the trend. The scientists wanted to see the their standard visualization coupled with the new visualization. So the new visualization, look, we can see the geometry of the animal. We can see the, how the animal is, the posture of the animal immediately. What we did was we reintegrate the x, y, and z components of the acceleration and plot them in spherical space rather than time versus amplitude space. Right? the way that the acceleration vector should be visualized, essentially. And we mapped the unit vectors onto a sphere. And then immediately we can infer animal behavior. We can map pressure to the radius if we want to. So this shows the animal swimming at the surface, and then the pressure increases, so that pressure is mapped to radius, and that represents diving behavior. And the diving behavior is very easy to see now that it's visualized in this space. So descent, swimming, hunting behavior, more searching behavior, and then an ascent. Right, that's clearly a searching behavior for, for food or something else, and then some, some probably some hunting. And this spherical space is interactive. So that's rotating it and zooming and panning at different angles. This is a spherical histogram. So that bins the vectors into, into unit rectangles. And the more time that the animal spends in that posture or in that orientation, the longer the histogram bin. Right, so we can, we can see the postures and the states that the animal spent a long time in. Now the other thing I didn't mention is 
this this yellow rectangle is the length of time that the user is currently focusing on. So rather than focusing on all the time at the same time, the, the user chooses a special region, and then the region is plotted up close in the left-hand corner. Now this is the idea of clustering the vectors into different groups. So assigning each data, data point to a group that represents some interesting aspect of the animal behavior. And this is adjusting the probability of any data sample belonging to one of the clusters. So these are, these are clusters of animal postures calculated using C-means clustering, right? And then we can represent the clusters as spheres, and then we can connect the spheres or the postures with edges that represent transitions from one orientation to another successively, right? So we can see where the transitions happen between what kinds of states and what kinds of postures. And we can see the most popular ones, right? So that information pops up immediately when we use visualization to reduce. And I think we'll do one more example. Any questions about the marine biology example? I think we'll just do one more and then stop. So the last example I will talk about today is the molecular dynamics simulation. Anybody worked on molecular dynamics simulation before? So this is, this is a collaboration with the computational biology group at Oxford University. Anybody have friends in that group? You never know. So the goal here is to understand biology at the level of molecules, or the molecular level. And there are analog approaches and solutions to this problem. I'm not, I'm not intimately familiar with them, but biologists do run experiments at the molecular level and try to understand behavior of molecules using exper experiments on nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. But you can imagine that these machines and these experiments are not cheap. Right? If, if, if I asked for a, an NMR spectroscopy machine for my birthday, chances are I wouldn't get one. <laughs> so th there's a whole field of people, the computational biologists, trying to address this problem in the digital world, right? Because it's much less expensive than the analog world. They do try to compare their digital solutions or molecular dynamic simulations with the experimental results, but that's another challenge in itself. As with any simulation data, all the simulation people generate massive amounts of data, right? They try to use the latest high performance computing machines and they just try to, they generate essentially endless amounts of data. And so they asked us if we could help them to try to visualize some molecular dynamic simulation data to make sense out of it. So let's look at that. So this is the interaction of lipids and proteins. That's what this simulation data shows. And we developed some visualization software that tries to help understand this. These holes are the proteins, so to speak. And then the paths are the lipids or the atom trajectories. And they're trying to visualize the interaction between the atom trajectories and the proteins. And we, we, this is work in progress, by the way. We're, we're trying to develop visualizations to help molecular, bio, 
computational biologists understand this data as with a special focus in this case on path filtering and selection. So given this massive numbers of trajectories, hundreds of thousands, millions, or billions of trajectories over multiple time steps, is it possible to select a subset of those trajectories based on interesting properties that help help the biologists understand the behavior? So that's what we're developing tools for filtering and selection of these trajectories to try to understand the behavior. And this is just changing the, the time step at which we visualize the paths. This is filter the paths by their length. So we can focus on shorter paths, or we can focus on longer paths. So those are the short ones, right? And then we can slide the filter over so we see the long paths or the long trajectories. So we can change the focus. This, again, is, is like a focus and context visualization. We can filter the paths based on curvature. So we, we chose a few properties that we hoped would be interesting for the, for the computational biologists. This one is curvature. So these are high, highly curved paths. So all the paths with the highest curvature, for example. And that's the user interacting with the, with the data. So that's a that's a real time, right? So this is an interactive visualization. This is another kind of path curvature. Rather than total path curvature, this is normalized path curvature. Show it so it shows the the highest from the highest to the lowest normalized path curvature interactively filtered and visualized the the atom trajectories are actually in three dimensions but they're limited to more of a layer that's analogous to like the, the earth's biosphere so that the z dimension is, is relatively small compared to the x and y dimensions. So we can visualize the projected 2D space or the, the volumetric 3D space. This is visualizing, trying to, to look at trajectories in, in both the 3D and the 2D space. So that's a, a, a single trajectory. And then color mapping. These are the, the this is the atom across different time steps. So each one of these represents a time step in the simulation. And this is the user experimenting with the different 2D versus 3D representation. So there's the 3D representation, and there's the 3D representation projecting. So biologists like to see both the 2D and the 3D representations. So there's the 3D representation and there's the, there's the same, but projected onto the 2D plane. The standard visualization packages for this type of data are constrained to a two-dimensional plane. And they're generally not interactive. There's generally no user interaction. And this is, this is not very exciting filter, the Z-based filter, which base, filters the paths based on their depth. But actually, this is my favorite filter. So the user can choose at which depth to visualize the trajectories and then slide the filter along the Z-direction. And as soon as he started to show me that, I thought, oh, this is really interesting, actually. I really like being able to select the filters just based on their depth. So that's actually my favorite one, even though it's not technically the most exciting filter. Okay, so if anybody's just 
curious, uh, we're going to stop now. The, the next example was from foam simp dynamic simulation. But in order to keep with the schedule and give everybody a coffee break, we're going to stop there. The other examples I have are foam dynamic simulation and rugby visualization. But we're going to stop because the audience was so enthusiastic with their questions and comments. So thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any remaining questions or comments. I think I, I wore everybody out with this power, power presentation. So we're going to take a 20-minute break. We'll meet here back at 20 past 11 and continue with the next session. Thanks again. Happy Tuesday.